basic teaching is that all calories are metabolically alike. The main problem is obesity. And we just have to get people to eat less and move more. They'll attain a healthy weight and the problem will take care of itself. Um, now that's, of course, disregarding much evidence that food independent of its calorie content affects our hormones, metabolism, and even the expression of our genes in ways that would importantly influence not just the likelihood that we would succeed with weight loss and avoid obesity, uh, but also our risks for type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, even cancer at any given body weight. Right. So for those of us who are in this camp of understanding that it's more than just eating less and moving more, it's it's almost mind-boggling that the the sort of mainstream dietary community does not embrace that. And so that's when we have to look to the science and say, what does the science say? And you and your group did a study to show that calories do matter. And so if I can, you probably know the details better than I do, but you had a 21 overweight patients um, and you had a run-in period where they had a 10% weight loss. And then you had different isocaloric regimens that they were eating and you provided the food for them. And it was based on their percentage of carbohydrates. And what you found was the lowest percent carbohydrates had the highest increase in their resting energy expenditure by 325 calories per day. That seems conclusive. The type of food you eat affects your resting metabolic rate. So it's not, and it was isocaloric. So it's not simply calories in, calories out. So why doesn't a study like that change the paradigm? Okay. Well, first off, uh, no single study is conclusive and definitive. And we can talk about that in a moment. But let me provide the broader context. You know, on the one hand, uh, w obesity treatment has focused on so called calorie balance. Uh, eat less, move more, doesn't matter how you do it. And that is the primary focus both for public health uh, as well as treatment in the clinic. So an alternative paradigm um, which we've been developing along with others is called the carbohydrate insulin model. Now it focuses on carbohydrate and insulin but because you, you need a name for something, but it's not a single nutrient, single hormone hypothesis. It's it proposes that we've had it backwards, that overeating doesn't cause obesity over the long term, that the process of getting fat causes us to overeat. Now, that's a little hard for the mind to hold, but think about it. Uh, think about what happens in pregnancy. A woman um, typically eats a lot more. She's hungry. She has food cravings. She eats more. And the fetus is growing. But which is coming first? Is the overeating causing the fetus to grow? Or is the growing fetus that's taking up extra calories triggering the mother to be hungry and eat more? You know, of course the latter. We understand it. The same, same is true for an adolescent in a growth spurt. You know, you and I, no matter how much we eat, aren't going to force our bodies to get, get to any taller, unfortunately. <laughs> It's the process of getting taller in that adolescent in the growth spurt that's causing him or her to eat hundreds or sometimes thousands of calories more than would otherwise be the case. So that's obvious in those situations. Why not consider the possibility that a rapidly growing fat mass that's being triggered to take in too many calories could be the cause of excessive hunger um, and the overeating that follows. That's the carbohydrate insulin model. We focus on carbohydrates because they've flooded our diet in the last 40 years during the low fat years. Carbohydrates, especially the processed kinds, sugar, but just as much, or perhaps even more so, uh, the refined starches, uh, raise insulin. And insulin, you know, I, I call insulin the miracle grow for your fat cells, mm -hmm. just not the sort of miracle you want happening in your body. You know, insulin, fat cells don't do much of anything until they're told what to do by hormones. And insulin is the, old, is the most potent anabolic hormone. It promotes fat cell store, calorie storage at fat cells. It inhibits release of fat from the fat cells. States of excess insulin action consistently lead to weight gain, you know, such as mutations that lead to 
overproduction of insulin or in type 2 diabetes where uh, insulin is started. Weight gain c- consistently occurs. And the opposite is also true. States of inadequate insulin action, such as type 1 diabetes, a child first coming to attention who, because of an autoimmune attack on the beta cells, can't make enough insulin, that child will have invariably lost weight before treatment, whether he or she is eating 3,000, 5,000, or 7,000 calories a day. Now, if you don't have diabetes, the fastest way to change your insulin levels is with the amount and type of carbohydrate you're consuming. But beyond carbohydrate, protein, the types of fats we're eating, micronutrients, fiber, the state of our gut microbiome, and non-dietary factors like a sleep deprivation, Mm -hmm. stress, and an excessively sedentary life. All of these things affect fat cell function and determine whether the calories we're eating are uh, shunted a little bit more towards storage rather than oxidation. All you have to do is store a few grams of extra fat a day to mean the difference between staying lean and becoming uh, substantially, uh, having a substantial problem with obesity uh, after 10 years. So our, going back to the study, we, um, right, we brought people's weights down to stress out their body uh, adaptive mechanisms. These were people who had high body weight at baseline, brought their weight down by uh, at least 10%. And then we randomly assigned them to either a, an Atkins type low carb diet, a high carb diet, with 60% carbohydrate, or something in the middle, kind of a 40% 40 fat, 40% carbohydrate Mediterranean diet. And everybody got each of these diets for a month, and we measured energy expenditure, both resting and um, total energy expenditure by uh, a method called doubly labeled water. And that we found that despite the weight loss on the low-carb diet, there was no decline in total energy expenditure at all. We know that typically the body adapts to weight loss by becoming more efficient, and that makes losing weight harder and harder. But there was none of that adaptation on the low-carb diet, a potentially tremendous advantage to losing weight. On the high-carb diet, energy expenditure plummeted by more than 400 calories a day. So that difference of 325 calories uh, would translate into um, 35 pounds, perhaps, of weight loss without any change in calorie intake. So that's the difference between being lean and being obese right there, just that one difference. Potentially, you know, a a big part of the difference. And if you get changes in hunger, Mm -hmm. if you get lower hunger and fewer food cravings on a low-carbohydrate diet, has been reported in other studies, the effects could be potentially even larger. So why, you know, so this was a study that was published in JAMA, it certainly got considerable attention. You know, it it itself has limitations. It's just one study. It needs to be reproduced. And there are uh, a a group from the NIH published a sort of uh, rebuttal, uh, a counterattack on this hypothesis and on the study, reviewing other studies of diet composition and energy expenditure, claiming that there was no effect And uh, this meta-analysis by the NIH group um, was uh, used to claim that they had, quote, literally the term used was falsified the carbohydrate insulin model. Now, if you look at the studies that were included in this meta-analysis, virtually all of them, with just uh, maybe three exceptions, uh, 20, 20 or more studies, were two weeks or less. Okay, so the folks in the low-carb movement are immediately going to understand that when you cut back carbohydrate, especially into the ketogenic range, as some of these studies did, um, you, you need to allow the body to undergo an adaptive process. You've cut off carbohydrates, which is the main source of fuel for the brain, but yet ketones have not re- yet reached steady state. The classic starvation studies by Cahill and all and others, showed that ketones with complete fasting, with starvation, don't reach steady state until about two to three weeks afterward. And And how long was your study? Ours was a month. A month. So ours was long enough to see these adaptive changes, but almost all of the other studies published didn't. And so 
if you've cut off carbohydrate, but you're you're not yet adapted to that low to that high fat diet, what's going to happen? You're going to feel tired, right. um, you know, physically tired, mentally a little sloggy. We have a name for this. It's called the keto flu. Um, very well described. There are dozens of papers showing that it takes several weeks. And if you conduct your study during that short period of time of adaptation, you know, of course you're not going to see the full benefits of a low-carbohydrate diet. In fact, you might see some adverse effects. But I would make the comparison to a scientist wanting to study the effects of intense physical training on a sedentary population. You take a group of 45-year-old men who, uh, who are overweight, sit around all day watching TV, and suddenly you're giving them six hours a day of uh, physical activity boot camp. You know, they're running uh, track, they're doing calisthenics, they're yeah. engaged in contact sports six hours a day, and then you measure them three days later. What are you going to see? They're going to feel awful. They're going to feel tired. Their muscles are going to be sore. They're going to have decreased physical abilities. If you concluded at that point that physical training worsened fitness, um, you would be doing the same thing that these uh, very short-term low-carbohydrate diet studies are doing, that they're missing the boat. So we need longer studies. Our study and uh, the, the, the only the two or three others to date that are... Uh, of a month duration show benefit to the low-carb diet. Mm -hmm.